This video is sponsored by Ridge Wallet. Last week I tackled the first few films of One Piece against my will, and I thought by and large they were pretty good. Some, not so much, but you know we're getting more hits than misses. So how was this? We go pain, pain, flowers are scary, people turn into trees, we're all alone in this world. Huh. I'm, I'm sorry. This week I'm discussing movies 5, 7, and 10, but more importantly, I'll be discussing and giving my first impressions on Movie 6. From one of my favorite directors in Japan and the wider world, Mamoru Hosoda, this was a film that, well, it's hard to put it simply, but I will try. Because I'm totally not Mark, and these are my first impressions of, thoughts on, and review for, the stunningly beautiful, tragic, and horrifying One Piece Movies 5, Six, seven, and ten. Yo! One Piece is the best series I've ever read in my life. First impressions of the photos. Crazy everything. First up, One Piece The Cursed Holy Sword. One Piece The Cursed Holy Sword is a 2004 film produced and distributed by Toei Animation, with a runtime that's actually 95 minutes, but feels like 905 minutes. I didn't Ooh. like this movie. Of all the films in this series thus far, it bored me the most. However, with that said, there are aspects, specifically towards the beginning and the ending, that I did like, so let's take a closer look. The first scene is short and effectively introduces us to the main antagonist, Fu Future Trunks and the titular Cursed Holy Sword, which seems to primarily heal the wielder as well as severely harsh their chill. Once again, Nami is in search of treasure on a random tropical island while Luffy is getting fat on food. These films seem to really enjoy those tropes, and I say that because they use them a lot. I understand that it's a useful way of getting the plot to move forward, but gee golly gosh, if it doesn't feel like I've seen this setup a million times at this point. They even have the same marines chasing them for movie 4, so at least there's some internal consistency there, I guess. In the previous movie, I complimented the story for making use of Robin's backstory in an interesting and believable way to shed light on the exposition that's crucial to the story. They tried to do that here, but it's more in-your-face exposition with Robin vomiting up all of what we need to know in about a minute. How did she learn this? Some good old-fashioned book learning, I guess, because I guess Robin's character is that she likes books. Well, it looks like Zoro observed something. He goes to confront them when the rest of the crew are forced to flee the harbor due to the navy. There's this set piece that happens and I'm not sure if I like it here. Nami is the navigator, right? She's needed because she understands how the ship moves and maneuvers in relation to the weather better than pretty much anyone, arguably in the whole One Piece universe. Yet Luffy is the one that surprises Nami by instructing the ship to keep going straight because in doing so, it flies. This is the same man that thought jumping into a barrel was an effective mode of transport. And to make matters worse, the story injects some random chance and luck into the equation by having the ship land on the back of an animal and bounce, which doesn't really make sense, onto another body of water they didn't know was there. What happens when a movie is made completely driven by cocaine? Okay, so I guess the entire chase sequence there was only to split up the crew and start their search for Zoro, who, by the way, seems to be all pally pally with future trunks now. There's a lot of weird stuff happening on this island between Zoro teaming up with this dude, the Marines helping him, and a weird village with purple Dragon Balls. Luffy, after having splintered off from the main group alongside Usopp, begins fighting some future trunks. There's some fun animation, but overall, I'm not really feeling this villain. He doesn't really have any motivation for me to care about, and I have no idea what he's actually like, which doesn't help matters. Luffy ultimately loses, and then we get a nice gag with Usopp jumping off the cliff Luffy fell off of after him. It's probably my favorite part of this film so far, though once he does land, he discovers a hole and falls through it. Now, I've been avoiding this, but one aspect I found very little interest in were the village scenes. These make up a decent chunk of time spent in this movie, getting to know the villagers, the blue-haired lady, and the warriors of the village themselves. And while I can appreciate a portion of the runtime being dedicated to establishing new characters and fleshing them out, the vast majority are so vapid and relentlessly lifeless, it only serves to create a portion of the film that I have zero interest in, and really this is a problem that plagues the entire story. I do not care about Future Trunks and his cursed sword. You can call it a cursed sword all you want, it doesn't make it automatically cool. Okay, maybe a little bit, but that's besides the point. This sword, by and large, sucks. 
I do not care about blue haired lady or her village of people. I swear, if it got any more exciting in that village, a funeral might break out. We're given flashbacks, recantings of legends, further insight into the circumstances that have befallen herself and the character of Future Trunks, but I just can't bring myself to care. Primarily, the thing that we care about in these films are the Straw Hat crew and their safety. And so much of the film sees them sharing the screen with these characters instead of interacting with each other. For me, the most interesting scenes thus far have been the comedic sequences following Luffy and Usopp as they journey back to the main group, which, in a very obvious way, only serves the purpose of delaying Luffy's return to the action to end it. Which means my favorite portion of the second act comes from a delay sequence in the story. And that's sort of a problem, but I suppose it's unfair to label those scenes as just delays. They are also incredibly convenient too, because Luffy Luffy happens to find the purple balls which were taken from the village, might I add, completely by chance, and decided to pick them up and bring them back to the rest of the group. Anyways, let's wrap this up. They gotta bring the purple Dragon Balls to these temples for protection or something. Zoro turns on his captors and starts slicey slicey sword manning them. This is effectively the portion where all the significant action in the film takes place. Zoro loses his initial duel. Luffy takes over and does his rubber man hokey pokey wham bam thank you ma'am on future trunks. But oh no! He turns into sword Broly and man that moon is really big and red and man those temples are falling down. Thankfully however Zoro returns and asks Luffy to step aside such that he can finish what he started. And to be frank, this sequence is appropriately framed and feels totally right to me, unlike the rest of this movie. It's easily its strongest part. There's some really great shots with a nice bit of conflict nestled into Zoro's head. If I was to only look at this third act in isolation, I'd be very interested to look at the rest of the film, assuming it would be just as good. Unfortunately, the rest of it, at least to me, felt lifeless and at the worst of times, boring. From a visual front, it's consistent, and if you're a big fan of the series, there's some cute character moments in here for Zoro towards the beginning and end for you to enjoy. In addition to the comedic material covering Usopp's escapades with Luffy in the tunnels, it might be worth checking out. But for me, I can't say I'll personally be returning to this one. Next up is Movie 6, One Piece, Baron Omasuri and the Secret Island. One Piece, Baron Omasuri and the Secret Island is a 2005 film of sorrow, pain, and nightmare fuel that kept me up long into the night that I watched it. It was produced and distributed by, despite the strikingly different visual approach, Toei Animation. It's got a runtime of about 92 minutes of lighthearted fun, followed immediately after by Night Terrors. I would not be surprised if kids discovered new phobias while watching this film. But with that said, I'm a well-adjusted adult. Screw those kids. This movie was awesome. For those of you that don't know, I'm a massive fan of Amoru Hosoda, and one of my favorite movies is The Girl That Leapt Through Time. He has a list of massive titles to his name, and when I heard that he did a One Piece film, I was more than a little interested to see this thing in motion. And boy, does this one move. From a visual standpoint, I found this film incorporated more personality, expression, and emotion into a single frame or action sequence than perhaps any shonen movie I've ever seen in my life. This film is capital G gorgeous. This film hits different, and that's primarily because of the minimalist character designs and thin line work indicative of Hosoda's work. His style is so distinct you can pause it at any given moment and tell it's an Hosoda film just through expressions, line work, and framing. Visual impact is one thing, script writing is another, and this film is firing on all cylinders delivering in all of these departments. But let's ignore the sudden shift to pain and misery in the second half just for a moment. The first half is so much fun, and that fact is leveraged later to create the biggest shock I've had since I watched Watership Down as a kid. This film felt super short, especially in direct comparison to the last film. There wasn't a moment during this where I myself wasn't completely and totally invested in what was going on on screen. I was either laughing, snickering, or crying, but more on that later. The first half of this script focuses heavily on natural and quick exposition to get us into the story, centered specifically around lighthearted banter, character introductions, and a premise setup that I found to be fantastic and interesting. Most of the expository heavy lifting was taken care of in the first eight minutes minutes, if you believe that. Essentially, the crew want to go onto this pirate island for rest, relaxation, and fun. But once they arrive, they discover that everything is not as it seems. Confronted by a so-called baron with this 
this cute little flower on his shoulder and all of his followers. Because of this, the Straw Hats find themselves caught up in this game for survival. If they win this fishing game, they get the treatment they wanted, but if they don't win, then something nebulously bad happens. Now, naturally, everyone except Luffy doesn't want to do this, and the crew's already infectious dynamic is accentuated by some absolutely fantastic character animation. Like, once Usopp learns that this game requires him to catch a goldfish in a small net, he suddenly jumps to the opportunity to save the day, acting like the best gold fisherman in all the land, which honestly was so damn funny, helped enormously by the animation itself. And the entire first half is like that. And what's more is I think this scene offers me a chance to explore with you all why this film's pacing feels so snappy and entertaining. Almost every scene serves more than one single purpose. Unlike prior films where scenes were used to shout exposition at the audience, this one with Usopp on top of delivering comedy also introduces us to the powers and strengths of the crew as they cycle through different attacks and strategies to get the giant goldfish into the bucket. We get progression for the story towards the current goal, which is at the moment to get their reward. We also get the reaction from the Baron once the Straw Hats finally get the victory, and that's not even to make mention of the complex character dynamics at play throughout this scene that make it as enjoyable and fun as it is. Ending the scene in a brilliant way with a tracking shot following Chopper having been knocked into the ocean, the camera holds on him just long enough for us to think in our head, is anyone coming? And then it takes even longer. And would you know it, the first person down there after him was Luffy, the guy who can swim. This is a man that literally would not hesitate to throw his life away for his crew. The official canon has used this type of scene as a joke several times over, and it's often used for comedic effect. But this movie treats that scenario with real weight. It emphasizes Luffy's love for his crew, his family. And that's precisely the psychological burden this movie explores. Think of this small scene as a prelude, but yeah. That's just one example of a scene that will enhance everything coming afterwards. The Straw Hats themselves in this film are all perfectly characterized, but the antagonists are honestly just as quirky and fun. In the first contest with the goldfish, we were introduced to this overconfident, overweight guy named Muchigoro, but the second contest features four old short people dressed in frog costumes. There's also a head chef and a DJ, but no matter who it is, all of the back Baron's followers seem to have this plant on top of their heads. It's cute. So cute, in fact, I bet nothing horrific or existential could possibly come out of it. All of the individual challenges are great in their own ways, too. The second one, advertised as a simple ring toss event, turns into a high-speed gondola race, where the goal is to restrain their opponents in the life rings. This setup provides way more action than the prior, featuring the bickering and comedic goals from Zoro and Sanji teaming up, and the cowardly duo of Usopp and Nami. And these teams are honestly perfect for hijinks. Chef's kiss. Mwah! It was so easy to get sucked into the ebb and flow of the action that once Usopp accidentally flew off and left Nami alone to fend for herself, I completely forgot about him until he came back in with the clutch save. And on its face, this really isn't anything new. Movies are inherently like magic tricks. A lot of them follow the same steps, the same formula for creating tension and drama. If you see the same trick or setup multiple times, it loses its luster. This film uses perfect characterization as its sleight of hand, however. So forgetting about Usopp is just a testament to how invested I was in Zoro and Sanji's heightened conflict. Now, the ring toss event isn't the only thing happening during this portion of the movie also. I've spoken at length before about how the second act in the three act structure can be somewhat tiresome. Lord knows I found the Future Trunks movie to be boring as sin, but this really strong and exciting gondola ring toss competition with Nami, Usopp, Zoro, and Sanji is juxtaposed perfectly with a calmer, more subdued set of scenes. The crew members not participating in the ring toss, Luffy, Chopper, and Robin, are left to their own devices, and each of them explore the rest of the surrounding area. Robin decides to inquire about the flower on the shoulder of the Baron. While she attempts to extract information from Muchigoro, both Chopper and Luffy become acquainted with other folks that have come into conflict with the Baron in the past. Since these scenes aren't as action-packed, some younger viewers might lose interest. But I personally was fascinated by these building tensions. There's been an underlying uneasiness within this island from the get-go, and I want to know the island's secrets. Don't think I don't. I definitely didn't. This movie scared me a lot. We learn three crucial facts in each of these scenes. One, the Baron's followers aren't the only people on this island. Luffy meets a short mustachioed man, and Chopper meets a small family by way of their skittish father. He has three children with him, and the youngest ends up being the most important in this film. Secondly, something bad is happening. Luffy is told that the Baron is in fact behind it. And thirdly, the source of the trouble is some kind of flower. I know, not threatening. I get it. But wait. Thanks to Muchigoro, Robin learns the name of this plant as the Lily Carnation, 
And this becomes important later. All of these scenes are also shot to reinforce the tone of their respective interactions and encounters. Robbins is casual and intimate, so there's a lot of standard medium to close shots incorporating a significant amount of visual flair through the subtle and fun character acting. Chopper is continually framed with obstructed long shots. He's pictured small in the vast empty environments to communicate how isolated he is and how oddly quiet the town is. And Luffy is very clearly an abstract comedy take on the chase sequence complete with a Benny Hill reference. But once the chase reaches its conclusion, we get a very simple standoff with another humorous conclusion. Once all of these complete, we begin approaching the midpoint turn in the narrative and as you would expect, we get it in the middle of the second act. The purpose of this technique is to suddenly shake things up and put the main cast on the back foot as they head into the second half of the film and ultimately towards the third act or climax and conclusion. These are usually swerves that try to take the audience by surprise. Some are more effective than others and usually they work well enough. But as I'm watching Sanji show off in front of this iron chef and while Nami was talking with Muchigoro, I was greeted by a midpoint turn that shook me to my very core. In her conversation, the Nami learns that he he, his crew, and his captain were on a similar level to Goldie Roger. But the dialogue slows to a crawl when he starts talking about Roger in the present tense, citing that he only saw him recently. And that's about when a creepy look begins to fall across his face before mentioning the big storm. Immediately, the camera switches to Robin's point of view as she discovers the flower growing on the island. The flower she learned about from Uchigoro, and as the candles flicker and the scenes switch in a frantic fashion from various characters, it lands on Nami and Muchigoro's conversation. Welcome to the horror portion of the film, and it's bloody awesome. In a sort of existential and hopeless way that still has left me a little empty inside. So, after this, the crew grows concerned and things begin getting a little more serious. Chopper has been missing for quite some time now and Usopp and Robin are nowhere to be found. This is when Sanji reminds Luffy that this was all his idea in the first place, that he was the one who decided to participate in these challenges on behalf of everybody. Again, this is nothing really new to the series. The crew face Pam all the time at these situations Luffy recklessly barrels into, but rarely do we see them get irrationally angry at him. Here, it's not for comedy, there's weight to it, which I love. It's taking an element that existed in the manga and twisting it into something more serious. On the flip side, with his crew feeling tired or in the worst case scenario turned into a dried husk like Muchigoro, the Baron starts to announce the final trial. Luffy at this moment is still distraught at the thought that he might be responsible for his greatest fear to come to pass. That being his friend's demise. And this is when he gets serious, places his hat on his head and begins going toe to toe with the Baron, but he clearly can't stand up to him one on one. And just as he's about to die, he gets pulled down into one of the tunnels by the gentleman he met earlier. And while the rest of his crew gets taken out, most interestingly, the little green haired water imp gets taken out by Zoro and something interesting happens. <laughs> This is the first scene where we see the Baron's psychosis on full display and what this illusion he's been living in has been created for. Now, I will acknowledge that there is an element to this film where I can see some people taking issue with, and that is the fact a major component that creates the dire circumstances at the end is that the majority of the crew had a falling out with other individual members. And while it isn't a common occurrence to see these characters behave like this, it didn't really bother me in the slightest. I've been consistently viewing the Straw Hats as a family unit for some time now, and one almost surefire defining feature of a family is that they are prone to fighting and disagreement. The way Nami and Usopp fall out in this film is definitely something you've seen from a dysfunctional family, and the Straw Hats definitely fit that billing. The arguments they experienced here always felt like superficial spats that otherwise would have ironed themselves out in a matter of hours had the situation been better, but it wasn't better. It just so happens that this entire island is going to hell, and Luffy, literally in the island's underbelly, gets a first-hand look at the stark reality reality he's facing. In a heart-to-heart -heart revelation, Brief lets Luffy know that he has lost his own crew too, the toothbrush mustache pirates, all to the demonic flower at the heart of this island. When he reveals this information, he doesn't say that his crewmates died, he says that he's alone. Fear and sudden realization drains Luffy's face almost instantly. And with that, we quickly cut from the beginning of an explanation to the exact same scenario playing out right now with Chopper. The imagery is equal parts stark and horrific. Everything is black 
black, white, and muted. The carnation's presence is equal parts staggering and haunting as it slowly begins digesting its prey. The interesting thing here is that the adults are resigned to the outcome. Baron Omatsuri relishes in the abject terror while Papa walks away. Chopper, on the other hand, is 15 years old in this scene. He fights valiantly against overwhelming odds. The one who tries to save him first is Daisy, the youngest of Papa's three children. And that's when you realize that those that are too young to know any better, that do not know the pain of loss, they are the ones that fight the hardest. Papa does eventually turn around to fight, but he doesn't save Chopper. He pulls Daisy and the rest of his family away. He's there for them. He doesn't have the fortitude to stick his neck out for someone he doesn't know, because the one thing that he can't afford to lose right now is his own family. And after Chopper is gone, he's reprimanded by that same family for doing so. In this film, we have three separate captains all dealing with the challenges of life and death. The Baron lost his crew and it ripped his soul in half. He now clings onto the memory of his fallen comrades and wishes to inflict that same pain onto others. Brief, the mustached man, lost his crew as well, but instead of giving up and resigning himself to his fate, he stays and fights. Yes, he's alone, but the memory of his comrades lives on in his struggle for survival. And lastly, the father, Papa, is a coward. He didn't even compete in the challenges and ran away at the first hint of danger. He's too scared to act because he knows he'll lose what he values most. Ironically, the very family he wants to protect is the thing that's holding him back from true courage. Which brings us finally to Luffy, who is now alone. He's caught right in the middle of all three characters' current plight. His crew is still alive, and they need his help. The outcome of the next half hour will determine whether or not he becomes one of the three other captains, or learns from their mistake to chart his own path. It's no accident he winds up with Brief in the tunnels. The only one on the island left with the requisite backbone to stand up to the Baron is also the one who gives Luffy purpose and motivation. He instantly leaps into action, setting off a dramatic showdown with the Baron, but unfortunately, it's too late. One by one, each of his crew members are taken. Each new victim results in an arrow in one of Luffy's limbs, helplessly pinning him against a rock. Will you fight with only your left leg, the Baron asks, and Luffy responds by raising his left leg. The weight of this scene is honestly smothering. The mere thought of losing his oldest and most loyal crewmate in Zoro sends him into a frenzy. He launches his head towards the flower, exposing his neck in the process to the Baron's arrows. Blood flies and it looks like he's struck in the head. The fatal blow, however, was missed. He caught an arrow with his teeth, but the next moments bring us nothing but pain and tragedy. A close-up of Luffy's enraged face is cross-cut with Zoro melting into the flower. Rage turns to disbelief and finally grief as the Straw Hat Captain slams lifelessly back to the rocks below. There is no music, no swell of evil chords. The Baron simply walks forward and speaks harsh truths. Luffy is now alone on the Grand Line. The rest of the Baron's followers come back to life. They literally feed on the death and misery of others. Only then does the Baron twist the knife, taunting Luffy while the flower on his shoulder literally chews on his crew. And while it does so, he offers him a quick relief. Death. Growing up, I always appreciated the hero of any story that could stand up to anything. That when faced by overwhelming odds in the face of absolute destruction, when given two options, does the impossible and creates his own option. Characters like Goku, Iron Man, Spider-Man, and countless others in anime and fiction all have this in common, and I think there's tremendous utility in that sort of hope for young people. But I dare say that this particular film, more so than any other I've seen in this genre, is better suited for adults. The themes in it are harsh and cruel, almost unreasonably so. And while the circumstances are not realistic, the pain Luffy is facing in it is easy to empathize with. Because of what's transpired, I can appreciate at this moment in time, Luffy feels like he has nothing left to fight for. Having traversed impossible odds in the face of absolute evil and cruelty in the East Blue and the Grand Line, he finally found himself in a circumstance where he couldn't find a solution. Okay, so... To say that this moment took me by surprise would be an understatement of the highest order. As a massive fan of what's transpired at the Shibaudi Archipelago in the manga, for a scene like this in this film to exist in such a powerful fashion had me not only invested, but I was very much tearing up. This film succeeds on many different levels, but for me, the most successful aspect of it was how it pulled me in, gave me hope, and then ripped it away. One character at a time before leaving the symbol of hope in the series, a hollow husk of a human being. 
defeated and crushed by the weight of his circumstances, this created the perfect time in the film for the writer to deliver this swerve. This last minute save that made me audibly gasp as it happened. With this moment made even more potent by one fantastic piece of dialogue, the Baron taunts that almost every captain has chosen death over solitude. And as he says that, we as an audience already know of one that hasn't chosen death. And as the Baron prepares his final blow, Brief's tunnel opens up to save Luffy. Utterly spectacular pacing, execution, and dialogue. Going from a place of absolute despair to that of uplifting hope is my absolute favorite tonal shift in storytelling. It highlights not only a clear contrast, but if done the right way, it can also prey on your anticipation. And once we've experienced that despair, the audience as a whole is ready to be brought back to hope. In this next scene, in an almost catatonic state, Luffy remains listless and in shock over the loss of his crew. He He's not thankful for being saved. He's simply struggling to process what has just happened. And now, it's time for hope. Beginning to stir once again, Luffy starts to come to his senses. There's a chance? Brief places the hat on the head of Luffy, the captain of the Straw Hat Pirates, and reassures him that he has something left to fight for, that there is hope, but he needs to leave now, before finally saluting him. We are now in the end game. Emerging from a cloud of dust like the force of nature the future king of the pirates should be, Luffy effortlessly dodges all of the attacks of the Baron, utilizing this newfound motivation and the tunnels from his friend. He has a second chance at this, a second chance to save his friends, his family. The Baron has laughed menacingly in the face of trust, friendship, and loyalty, but it's that very aspect of Luffy's character that will be the difference maker in this exchange. As Brief helps to distract the Baron as Luffy begins sprinting his way towards the giant <laughs> Luffy is here to save his friends. And right now, Brief falls under that category too. Enraged by this, Luffy breaks one of the arrows in his grip before firing a massive punch towards the Baron, drilling him in the face, meeting his mark. And with a reassuring stare, Luffy looks back towards Brief and comically makes the salute of the toothbrush mustache pirates toward him. The old Luffy is back. It's time to save everyone. Filled with purpose and with a series of ferocious attacks at full power, Luffy lands consecutive blow after blow on this giant plant. And as it begins to come apart, the group rejoices. And that's when the little girl says something is wrong. That the voices aren't coming from that, but from somewhere else. This is the most grotesque scene in all of One Piece bar none and it's not even close. And once again, this doesn't put me off the film in the slightest I want to make clear. The darker the place this film can take you, the more potential it has, I think, to take you out of it and uplift you. Revealed to be a scapegoat and not the main flower, the giant illusion reveals itself to be composed of thousands if not millions of those deadly arrows of Baron's creation. Now all pointing toward Luffy, the real flower of the hour, reveals itself in all of its horrific might. The sound design for this creature, this parasite that preys on the fear and loneliness of people, has a sound and moan that accompanies it that honestly made me feel like a small kid watching my very first horror film. And once this torturous contorted monster reveals its true form on the Baron's shoulder, the blood red moon overlooking this spectacle is blotted out by a storm of arrows falling from the sky towards Luffy, meeting their mark and planting themselves like a traumatizing field of flowers around the young straw hat pirate. Around this point in the film is when I felt physically and emotionally uncomfortable. And if you'd believe it, this is the most shocked I've been while watching an anime film. I've seen harrowing stories depicting horrific events over the course of my life, many that have left a mark on me. But to take a character so full of hope, enthusiasm and optimism, and to throw him into a situation where he is on the cusp of death and emotional breakdown has affected me like few films I've ever seen. Whether it's the gaunt, distraught face of Luffy, his rattling quiet moans of agony, or the crimson palette that seems to be bathing the entire scene itself, this is horror in its purest form, and I will never forget it. Resigned to defeat, Papa begins to turn tail and run when his daughter shouts out to Luffy that she can still hear his crew. He still has something to fight for, and once again our brains make a comparison. The once bouncy, uplifting, carefree captain, now pierced all over his back by arrows, forces him to slowly hobble, to try to do something. Once again, there's no music in this section. It's as if all life and joy 
has been sucked out of this scene. All we can hear are the whimperings from Luffy and the rattling of the arrows jutting out from his back. Papa leans down to his daughter and asks if she's sure, because he can't seem to hear anything. It's at this moment the daughter reveals to him that all the instances where he's tried to pretend or to impress them, she knew that he was really scared, that he was always trying to pretend to be a hero for her. But then the little girl says that she always knew that her dad was really strong and brave, and that she never needed to be convinced. Overcome by emotion and a sudden desire to be the man his daughter believes him to be, Papa picks up a bow, one of the arrows in the rocks, and takes aim on the disgusting plant. With its squeals hard, its image imitating, and Papa's aim shaky, he releases his attack. An action that was made a reality by the belief his daughter had for him, and it destroys the monstrous plant and in an instant in what I thought was an inspired decision all of the Baron's crew suddenly turned to trees all of this time they have been illusions and now the illusion is gone the Baron is alone left to stew in the filth of the floral remnants that gave him the reality he wanted incensed he turns his attention to the father <laughs> There's an interesting implication right here with this attack. Typically, at the very end of these films, the Straw Hats all win the day, the side characters say their goodbyes, and all is well. And while this film does end on an uplifting note in one respect, showing relief wash over Luffy's face before he returns to his normal giddy self, this movie also makes the interesting choice of implying the Baron is now dead. After the punch from Luffy, the screen goes black and all we hear is his monologue, lamenting over the death of his friends until they all respond to him, saying sorry that he's been left alone for so long, as if to imply that he's met them or reconnected in the afterlife. And while this isn't something we've come to expect from Luffy or even One Piece in general, I'm not exactly sure what sort of future or old alternative there was for a fully fleshed out and complex character like the Baron to have. This is a film that isn't afraid to show people at their absolute worst, and the ending to this, like many great films, is one that I could see being discussed and argued over for quite some time. But what do I think about this film now that all is said and done? Well, put quite simply, it is now one of my favourite films I've ever seen in my life. It invokes laughter, tears, hope, despair, and relief, all in the span of an hour and a half. One important thing to take into consideration, however, is is, it's as effective as it is because of the manga and the story associated with it carrying all the heavy lifting in understanding the characters of the Straw Hat crew. But what this movie does with them is truly something to behold and one I will be sure to come back to for many, many years to come. An absolute marvel of a film. Okay, that was sufficiently heavy, time to move on to something a little more lighthearted. Next up, One Piece Mega Mega Soldier of Karakuri Castle. This video is brought to you by Ridge.com slash TNM. Most people are still using wallets designed in the 1990s and in this modern landscape, it's seriously outdated. And I should know. I've been using the same wallet since I was 15 years old and that means I've been using some outdated wallet for the last 14 years of my life. In the same way phones have gotten more practical and compact over the last few decades, so too have wallets and it's honestly made a massive difference to my pockets. Personally, I hate having cumbersome items in there and this totally fits my new lifestyle. It holds up to 12 separate cards, plus room for cash, and there's over 30 different colors and styles, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium to choose from. And if that wasn't enough to win you over yet, check out their 30,000 five-star reviews. The durable nature of each of these wallets comes with a lifetime warranty, so in theory, you could buy this one wallet and carry it for life. And the Ridge team have told me that they're so confident that you like it that they'll actually let you test drive it for 45 days. That means you can send it back for a full refund if it's not up to your own standards. Right now, there's a special offer going where you can get 10% off with free worldwide shipping and returns. And you can get all of this by going to ridge.com slash TNM and using the coupon code TNM. Link is in the description. One Piece Mega Mecha Soldier of Karakuri Castle is a 2006 film produced and distributed... Yeah, okay, I think you get it by now. It's all done by Toei Animation. The opening to this one is actually quite captivating, possibly for more than one reason. The best excuse... I mean, best part of this opening is that it utilizes the film technique known as the mystery box. The Straw Hats have found a treasure chest and they expect vast amounts of wealth to lie within, but they get something completely different. And oh, by the way, the Merry is floating away with no one on board, and their current boat is on 
fire. This, albeit small bit of tension, made for a fun opening that certainly held my attention. Within the first seven minutes of the story, we've been introduced to the lady in the treasure chest, have established the overall goal and next destination. A means of getting there and have seen Nami's chest continue to jiggle in really forced and strange ways. I wonder if this is a sign of things to come. Wink, wink. Anyways, the title card drops as they make their way towards the old lady's island in search of this golden crown she's told them about. And this is essentially how we're all introduced to the rest of the main cast we'll be dealing with on the island with the seemingly misleading name of Mecca Island. It seems the island home of the old lady is hostile towards pirates, and as soon as they reclaim her, they begin operating their defensive systems against the Straw Hat pirates, offering up some nice opportunities for the machines sent to destroy the ship, for Zoro to defend it, and for Nami's chest to continue to defy physics. Even though the ship was damaged, the island's defenses and the songs that were sung as they approached have filled them with more motivation to find its mysterious treasure. And this is when I begin taking issue with this film. Obviously, almost every film has some level of contrivance, and these convenient happenings are here more often than not to help move the plot forward, and I can appreciate that. However, when I notice these conveniences, it really takes me out of the story being told. It ruins my immersion. You see, in this scene, the crew are struggling to decipher the riddle in the song. However, when Luffy solves it, it's revealed that the answer could have only been observed from the sea in the exact position they are currently floating. I guess they're super lucky then. Okay. It's revealed that the inhabitants of the island have gotten as far as they have with the riddle. However, in a matter of moments, the crew discover, once again, by pure chance, the rest of the riddle as Luffy punches the snakehead, revealing a cave. Because of this, Ratchet, the lord of the island, figures it a good idea to utilize them to solve the rest of the mystery. Also, Robin and Nami wear these outfits, despite no one else on the crew changing their clothes when they left. Why did they change their clothes? Luffy agrees to Ratchet's terms, and so they all begin making their way towards the mouth of the snake. I honestly enjoyed this section. There's a fun bit of tension and some great teamwork on display from the Straw Hats as they navigate the treacherous passageways into it. Naturally, as has been the trend with the mystery thus far, drum roll please. Now, Luffy once again solves the next few steps in an admittedly, albeit convenient, fashion. Though once it's uncovered that the island is a giant turtle, yes, you heard me, a giant turtle, Ratchet reveals that he has no use left for the pirates anymore as he wants to rule the world. Of course! With the giant turtle. Of course! I don't think this is a particularly great implementation of a world-ending conquering strategy, but who am I to say it's not? Plus, the movie's almost over and I do not want to delay this monstrosity any further. As I said, this is the final section of the film and it's pretty straightforward and by the books. A weapon to surpass Metal Gear. Now that Ratchet has what he needs, Luffy and the gang need to stop him before it's too late, all the while dealing with his followers and traps along the way. It's a typical raid the castle type scenario. There's some decent action and some cool set pieces with Zoro, Sanji, and Robin, whose know-how and powers are used to creative effect a couple of times in this story, which I appreciate. But taking center stage in this conflict, of course, between Ratchet in a giant robot suit, is Luffy. As the main event of the film, it receives the most screen time, although personally I found it to be my least favorite fight in the film itself. I think this in part had a lot to do with the fact that I didn't like or even connect with the character of Ratchet on a single level. Very much like most of these One Piece films, Ratchet is a one-dimensional, one-note character that is there to serve a single purpose before fading into our subconscious, never to be thought of again. And really, these are the biggest weaknesses of these films for me. Aside from movie six and perhaps movie four, the antagonists don't seem to capture my interest at all. And that's a shame because a lot of these films do a great job in creating natural and lovable interactions between the various Straw Hats. Nano machine, son. They harden in response to physical trauma. With that said, Luffy wins while doing the Rubberman Hokey Pokey, and I get to move on to the modern One Piece films. Overall, I'd say this one is a real middle of the road type story. It's not terrible, but it's definitely not great. I can't say I'll be returning to this one, but I don't have bad memories from it either. Well, except for. Next up, One Piece, Strong World. This is by far the longest One Piece film I've reviewed to date. With a runtime of 113 minutes, despite being almost two hours long, the pacing in this one is actually remarkably good. The first 30 minutes largely concern itself with introducing us to the new antagonists of the picture, as well as the Straw Hat crew. However, what adds interest to the first 30 minutes is how it's structured. Beginning in a set of confusing circumstances as the crew are split up, finding themselves dealing with an assortment of intimidating and fierce 
piece amidst the floating rocks in the sky before showing us how they in fact got into the situation they find themselves in. This is interesting into and of itself, but what adds a ton of flavor and interest to this film for me is its writer and its antagonist. This is the first film in the One Piece cinematic universe that was penned by Eiichiro Oda, and while I thought some of the prior films did a fantastic job at capturing the heart of One Piece, none can achieve that same feeling One Piece can offer if it's not outlined by the walking One Piece encyclopedia himself, Mr. Oda. But I think what makes One Piece for me so enthralling is how it always feels like a massive sprawling story that's interconnected with thousands of other chapters. And while as I said the other films achieved great heights, none of them could claim to be part of the greater story unlike this film. Additionally, what I found interesting about this particular piece of film was that it comes with additional required watching before you actually watch it in the form of One Piece Episode Zero or Chapter Zero if you wish to read it. A 15 minute long flashback sequence detailing the history and lore behind the main antagonist of this story, Shiki. Having come into conflict with Roger and having lost, he can't believe it when Roger in fact gets taken in and placed on the execution block by the Navy. Not one to take this information well, thinking how on earth the weaklings of the Navy could possibly apprehend such a formidable captain in Roger, he takes it upon himself to take on Sengoku and Garp at once, destroying half of Naval HQ. He gets taken to Impel Down, but once he's ready, slices off his own legs to free himself and escape the facility. Not to be seen for another 20 years. Around the same time, this film takes place. And really, this is another trend Oda has managed to end also. Shiki isn't a one-note character. He has a backstory with needs, desires, ego, and shame. That coupled with his quirky, fun personality and crew, and we have the makings of an entertaining foil for Luffy to bounce off of. Or at least he will, but... For now, after Nami demonstrated her fantastic navigation and forecasting skills, she gets stolen from the Straw Hats by Shiki, before the rest of them get cast off into random parts of a floating archipelago. Now isolated or in various groups, the Straw Hats need to reconnect and save their crewmate Nami. And to be honest, they most certainly do regroup, and much faster than I anticipated, which really helps the pacing. Though it did make me wonder, how and why is the story progressing this way? Well, it's all in the service of the best midpoint swerve of all the movies I've seen. While I adore what movie 6 did with its swerve, I feel like this one in Strong World felt distinctly more One Piece and offered a lot in the way of future setup moving into the final act. And it delivers this midpoint in a really fun, creative, and powerful way. To get to this point, the prior goal of finding and regrouping with Nami takes an unexpected swerve. With the help of a giant bird with electrical powers, instead of being rescued, Nami takes the initiative and escapes successfully, meeting up with Luffy at first, but later Zoro, Sanji, Usopp, and Chopper too. We see all of these characters regroup at different moments, but the funniest for me came after all the heartfelt smiles and excitement. Mm. I found unreasonably funny. I really enjoyed the angle that this film takes in establishing its stakes. Shiki is targeting the East Blue, where most of the crew is from. And what's more is, Shiki is going to put on a demonstration today with the only village in the floating archipelago he's created, and he intends to level it. And who's standing there to defend it? Nami and the rest of the East Blue. While Chopper didn't come from the East Blue, Luffy, Zoro, Sanji, Nami, and Usopp all are from there, and they're all there to defend against this massive force in Shiki. The sun piercing through the horizon creates a gorgeous hue that bathes the entire fight sequence. This is one of the only times in One Piece where we see a large portion of the Straw Hats all focus on one character. However, despite this... <laughs> He is impossibly powerful, and at this point in the series, possibly the strongest they've ever faced. This is one of the last remnants from Roger's era of piracy, and he's after taking out all of the strongest fighters from the Straw Hat Pirates with little to no effort. From a defiant stand against Shiki, to being unconscious and trapped within a rock pillar, leaving Nami alone to bargain for their lives. However, before she leaves and becomes Shiki's companion and navigator, he offers her the chance to leave a farewell message for her crew. And it's this aspect of Shiki's character that once again adds a three-dimensionality to him. In this scene, he felt as shockingly imposing as he did because he brought more to the table than simply an evil and brooding persona. Throughout this film, he's been reasonable, shown to have a sense of humor, and even sometimes has been downright silly. And when you go from silly and lighthearted to dominant and uncompromising, that's when the audience feels it the most. The audience, more than anything else in a story, resonates when it feels contrast. Had he been a person that was brooding with confidence 
and always trying to appear powerful, if he were to eventually demonstrate that power, he wouldn't be nearly as impressive because the viewer was prepared for it, sort of bracing themselves. And the very fact that that is not how he is written is the core reason behind why he is, at least for me, so effective as an antagonistic force in this story, creating what will be a terrific motivator in a farewell message Nami leaves behind, which will inform and inspire the remaining half of this story. And seeing as this film is almost two hours long, instead of cramming it into the end of this video, I'm going to cover the second half of this film in next week's video, alongside Film Z, Film Gold, and Stampede. I hope to see you there, but for now, that'll do it for this video. I've been Totally Not Mark, I'll see you all next week, and thank you all so much for watching.